Genetics helps us understand the biological programming behind all life forms. But what exactly is the science of genetics? Here is a cell, the basic unit of all living tissue. In most cells, there is a structure called a nucleus. The nucleus contains the genome. A genome determines a person's traits by influencing factors on a cellular level. Genetic information is stored in every cell's nucleus. Structures called chromosomes carry this information in the form of deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA. In this short video, we're going to answer this question, what are chromosomes? And so let's begin with the pre-quiz. Could you take these four terms, chromosome, base pair, genome, and gene, and could you, number one, define them, and then number two, could you rank them in order from the largest to the smallest? We're going to do that at the end of this video, and so these are the four topics that we're really going to revolve around. But the first thing I want to get out there is that there are different types of cells, and so in a prokaryotic cell, like a bacteria, they really only have one chromosome. It's going to be one loop of DNA, and it's going to be bound tightly in what's called the nucleoid region on the inside of that cell. But generally, when we're talking about chromosomes, a lot of the time we're referring to those chromosomes inside the nucleus of a eukaryotic cell, like in your cells or the cells of a plant or the cells of a fungi. And when you look closely inside that nuclei, you can see these characteristic X-shaped chromosomes. And those are really sections of DNA that have been cut down to make it more usable. And so a good analogy is like an encyclopedia. This is an encyclopedia of cell biology. And you could imagine this would be a really hard book to open if it was one large book. And so it's easier to break it down into individual topics. So A to B or C to E. It makes it easier for you to use the book. It make it easier for them to copy the book. And that's really what chromosomes are. They're like individual sections of a larger piece of information, which is called our genome. Now remember, you get two copies of your genome. You get one from your mom and you get one from your dad. And that's because we're diploid individuals. And so now let's kind of zoom in to the level of genes. And let's start at the largest level. We're just looking at the nucleus itself. And so what is a genome? A genome is going to be all the genetic information inside a cell. And so it's going to be contained within these chromosomes on the inside of the nucleus. You're also going to have a little bit of information in the mitochondria of an animal cell and in the mitochondria and chloroplasts of a plant cell. But it's all the genes that an individual cell has. Now if we were to isolate on one of those, what we call a chromosomes, then we see this characteristic shape. Now if you see it looking like an X like this, that means that it's gone through interphase and it's duplicated this two sides of the chromosome. And so in the center you have what's called the centromere. And we're not going to have a lot of genes there. But then you're going to find what are called the two sister chromatids. And so during interphase it's copied all the information. So the information on one side is duplicated on the other side. And so Another thing that's important to note at this point, that the DNA has been tightly bound so it can actually fit inside and easily divide inside the nuclei. Um, the typical genome inside a cell is going to be, you know, about three meters long. And so there's no way it could fit inside the nuclei if it wasn't tightly bound. And so again, a genome is broken down into chromosomes. But let's isolate on some of this bound DNA and proteins. And so as we zoom in, we start to see these beads that are wound tightly around each other, and those are called nucleosomes. And so as we look more deeply inside there, what we'll find is it's really made up of two things. You're going to have the DNA, which is going to be this thread. And then you're going to have these histone proteins. And so we're going to have eight of these histone proteins. And the DNA will essentially wrap around those. And then you eventually get what's called a nucleosome. So now let's zoom into this. Let's zoom into the DNA itself. And we'll find this is that characteristic double helix that we have. Now, again, we're really zoomed in, and we're finally at the level of the gene. And so what is a gene? A gene is simply going to be a section of that DNA that codes for one specific uh, protein. In other words, humans are made of proteins. All things are made of proteins. And so the genes are simply the recipe on how to make one protein. So here'd be one gene, here'd be another gene, here'd be another gene. And so we're going to have around 20,000 genes. Now you'll find that inside all this DNA, there's a lot of sections between the genes. And those are going to be regulatory portions that are actually turning those genes on 
or off. But if we isolate on one of these regions, then we finally get down to the level of the base pairs. And so these are going to be the nitrogenous bases. Adenine always bonds to thymine, and cytosine always bonds to guanine. And so what are these? These are the smallest bits of information. Now these will come together to code for specific amino acids, which eventually make the proteins, which eventually make us. And so again, Let's go through and review this. First of all, could you put these in order from the largest to the smallest? Take a second and try to do that. So it should go in order like that. So we've got the genome. What is the genome? Remember, it's going to be all our genetic information, not just the chromosomes in the nuclei, but also the genetic information found in the mitochondria and the chloroplast. So that's all of our genes. Uh, the chromosome are going to be just different segments of that genome cut into more usable forms that we can easily divide between cells. Genes are going to be parts of the chromosome. Each of those code for one specific protein. And then finally, the building blocks of those genes are going to be the base pairs. And so those are chromosomes, and I hope that was helpful. Each chromosome contains a long strand of DNA, tightly packaged around proteins called histones. Within the DNA are sections called genes. These genes contain the instructions for making proteins. Genes, DNA, and chromosomes are what make you who you are. They are the set of instructions that are given to you by your father and mother. These instructions are in your cells, and all living organisms are composed of cells. There are many different types, like nerve cells and hair cells and skin cells. They all have different shapes and forms, but every cell has the same basic parts. The cell has an outer border called the membrane, which contains a liquid material called cytoplasm. In the cytoplasm is the nucleus, and inside the nucleus are chromosomes. In humans, each cell normally contains 23 pairs of chromosomes, for a total of 46. 22 of these pairs, called autosomes, look the same in both males and females. The 23rd pair, the sex chromosomes, differ between males and females. Females have two copies of the X chromosome, while males have one X and one Y chromosome. The chromosomes are really long strings of DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. DNA is shaped like a ladder that's been twisted. This shape is called a double helix. The steps of the ladder are made of four bases. Adenine is A, thymine is T, guanine is G, and cytosine is C. A stretch of the DNA is called a gene. Your body reads the genes and the letters like a recipe and builds protein. The order of the bases in the DNA, along with the length and sequence of the gene, determines the size and shape of the protein it builds. The size and shape of the protein determine the function it will have in your body. Proteins make up cells, cells make up tissue, and tissue makes up organs, like your eyes and your skin. So the genes determine what you are, a cow, an apple, or a human, and what you will look like, the color of your hair, your skin, your eyes, and so on. When a gene is switched on, an enzyme called RNA polymerase attaches to the start of the gene. It moves along the DNA, making a strand of messenger RNA out of free bases in the nucleus. The DNA code determines the order in which the free bases are added to the messenger RNA. This process is called transcription.
Before the messenger RNA can be used as a template for the production of proteins, it needs to be processed. This involves removing and adding sections of RNA. After transcription, mRNAs move out of the nucleus and enter the cytoplasm. This mRNA strand acts as a template for protein synthesis. Present in the cytoplasm is an enzyme, amino acyl tRNA synthetase. The enzyme macromolecule has two binding sites. One site recognizes the amino acid, methionine. This is followed by binding of the ATP molecule and release of pyrophosphate, resulting in activation of amino acid. Finally, tRNA and the activated amino acid bind together. This amino acylated tRNA is known as MET tRNA and is released from the enzyme. This marks the commencement of the first stage of protein synthesis, the initiation stage. During the initiation stage, a small subunit of ribosome binds to the mRNA strand. The mRNA strand is made up of codons which are sequences of three bases. Then the ribosome subunit moves along the mRNA in five prime to three prime direction until it recognizes the AUG codon or the initiation codon. At this point, metTRNA, possessing the anti-codon UAC, pairs up with the AUG codon of the mRNA. Then a large subunit of ribosome combines with a small ribosomal subunit. The large subunit shows three sites, the aceptor site or the A site, the peptidyl site or the P site, the exit site or the E site. This whole unit forms the initiation complex. This is followed by the elongation stage. During this stage, another tRNA-carrying molecule of an amino acid approaches the mRNA ribosome complex and fits in the A site. Then a bond is formed between methionine and the amino acid molecule on the tRNA. As a result, metTRNA becomes deacylated. The ribosome then advances a distance of one codon and the deacylated tRNA shifts to the E site from where it dissociates. Meanwhile, another tRNA carrying amino acid molecule attaches to the A site. This is followed by the binding of the amino acid molecules. Repetition of this process leads to the formation of an amino acid chain. This event is called elongation. Finally, when the UAG codon or the stop codon reaches the A site, elongation is terminated. Termination is the last stage of protein synthesis. The chain of amino acid molecules is released from the ribosome. This released amino acid chain is the protein, and this part of protein synthesis is known as translation. Then the tRNA detaches from the mRNA. Ribosome detaches and dissociates into its small and large subunits. Professor Dave, I want to tell you about proteins. So we know about amino acids, and these are the monomers that will form proteins, which are also known as polypeptides. 
Proteins are polymers of amino acids, and they are the most diverse type of biomolecule in your body. Different kinds of proteins include enzymes that catalyze chemical reactions, receptors that control signaling in your body, hemoglobin, which carries oxygen throughout the bloodstream, muscle and organ tissue, which give your body structure and mobility, and so many other things. So how do amino acids polymerize? This happens when amino acids form peptide bonds with one another, such as the peptide bond between these two glycine units. Peptide bond formation is an example of a dehydration reaction because the two hydrogens and the oxygen marked in blue are lost, and two hydrogens plus one oxygen equals a water molecule. So, as a water molecule is lost, these two amino acids come together to form a peptide bond, which results in an amide. An amide is a functional group with a nitrogen atom next to a carbonyl. And this is the functional group that will connect each amino acid during polymerization. If two amino acids combine, we get a dipeptide. If between three and ten come together, we would call that an oligopeptide, since oligo means just a few. And if more than ten come together, we will call that a polypeptide, since poly means many, and proteins are large polypeptides of around 300 to 1,000 amino acids that are folded in such a way that they have some biological activity. When we look at any peptide, we must notice that there is an N-terminus, meaning the side of the chain that ends with the amino group, and a C-terminus, the side that ends with the carboxyl group. By convention, we typically write proteins with the N-terminus on the left and the C-terminus on the right. Each monomeric unit in the polypeptide is called a residue. So on this structure, we should be able to differentiate between each individual residue and locate the peptide bonds that connect them. Proteins are very large compared to simple molecules. They contain hundreds of amino acid residues, and they have very specific shapes from which their function is derived. So let's learn about protein structure. Protein structure follows a specific hierarchy, so let's start first with primary protein structure. The primary structure of a protein is simply the sequence of amino acids, with no attention paid to any aspect of three-dimensional shape. We can abbreviate each amino acid residue with either a three-letter code or a one-letter code, depending on how much you feel like writing. And here are both sets of abbreviations for your reference. The shape the protein will take depends on the primary structure, because it is the identity of all the side chains and the sequence they are found in that determines how a protein will fold up. To see this in action, let's look at secondary protein structure. Secondary protein structure describes localized conformations of the polypeptide backbone, meaning the folding pattern that a protein will exhibit over a few dozen amino acid residues. There are a few different motifs that a protein can utilize, so let's see what those are. First, let's understand that the backbone itself is essentially planar. The peptide bond has some pi bond character due to resonance, since there is a resonance structure where the lone pair on the nitrogen forms a pi bond, pushing the pi bond in the carbonyl up to the oxygen atom. We know that rotation is restricted around pi bonds, so even though it's not a formal pi bond between the carbon and the nitrogen, the backbone is fairly rigid, while the sigma bonds to the R groups can freely rotate, so it is mainly the side chains on each residue that have a flexible conformation. We also know that molecules with dipoles, or formal charges, will attempt to store energy by making electrostatic interactions, and amino acids have such features. So if this backbone can fold in such a way so as to let each residue interact with other residues, it will do so in order to adopt the lowest energy conformation. One way it can do this is by forming something called a beta-pleated sheet. The backbone will extend one way and then turn back to line up alongside the first part of the chain, so that NH bonds from one section can form dipole-dipole interactions with the carbonyls of an adjacent section. This stores energy, so it is an example of a favorable conformation, and one type of secondary protein structure. 
Another type of structural motif is called the alpha helix. This is when the backbone forms a spiral shape with about three or four amino acids per turn and all the R groups pointing out. Here, each amide group will interact with the amide group three residues above and the one three residues below. So, beta pleated sheets and alpha helices are the most common types of secondary structure, though there are all kinds of other coils and loops that are a bit more difficult to describe. The key thing to understand is that at this level, the polypeptide backbone begins to form shapes entirely dependent on how it can best store energy in dipole-dipole interactions by adopting the lowest energy conformation. And these structures contain so many individual atoms that we begin to depict them as colored strips rather than with conventional molecular line notation for practical purposes. Now let's move on to tertiary protein structure. Tertiary protein structure involves the further folding of the polypeptide chain to produce its overall three-dimensional structure. This folding is not random. It is specific to the protein and will occur in that specific way every time that particular protein is formed, since it is this shape that gives the protein its function. There are a few factors that influence tertiary structure. First, residues with hydrophobic side chains, like alkyl groups, tend to be found in the interior of the protein, so that they are not in contact with aqueous solvent. At the same time, residues with hydrophilic side chains, ones with formal charges or dipoles on them, tend to be found on the surface of a protein, so that they can make dipole-dipole or ion-dipole interactions with water molecules. All of this is just a way for the protein to maximize the electrostatic interactions it can make in solution, which is a big factor in determining the way the protein will fold. Another motif that stabilizes tertiary structure is something called a disulfide bond. We know that cysteine has an SH group called a thiol on its side chain, which is the sulfur analog of a hydroxyl group. If one cysteine is near another, these thiol groups can react with one another by mild oxidation to create a disulfide, which causes a covalent linkage between the two sulfur atoms and therefore can also covalently link two residues anywhere in the protein. This can help maintain the structural integrity of the protein through covalent bonds that are much stronger than the dipole-dipole interactions found in the various secondary structures. Overall, if the protein is highly folded and compact, we would call it a globular protein, whereas if it is long and spindly, we would call it a fibrous protein. Lastly, we can examine quaternary structure. Some proteins are just one continuous polypeptide chain, but some proteins involve multiple polypeptide subunits that can come together to form a larger protein. These units are not covalently bound. They make only electrostatic interactions with one another but the interactions are strong enough to allow the subunits to arrange themselves in specific ways. And it is the arrangement of these subunits that determines the quaternary structure of a protein, like hemoglobin, which consists of four totally separate polypeptides arranged in a specific way. If a protein is comprised of just one polypeptide, then it will not have quaternary structure. So to summarize, primary structure is just the sequence of amino acids. Secondary structure is the way the chain begins to fold on the localized level. Tertiary structure is the complete folding pattern of an entire polypeptide. And quaternary structure is the way multiple polypeptide subunits come together to form a larger protein. It is important to understand that even a tiny change in primary structure can completely change the overall protein. For example, sickle cell disease is a genetic disorder where just one amino acid residue in one of the subunits of hemoglobin is changed from glutamic acid to valine. Because the side chains of those two amino acids are so different, the mutation changes the folding pattern at that location and the resulting hemoglobin protein, which is responsible for carrying oxygen through the bloodstream, takes on a different shape, causing the red blood cells that contain hemoglobin to look like tiny sickles, which can then clog blood vessels. So we can already begin to see why understanding the structure and function of biomolecules is crucial if we want to understand health and disease. 
Let's keep learning about different biomolecules. Muscles are subject to ongoing breakdown and rebuilding, with the protein within a muscle being completely renewed every two to three months. Such forces favor protein synthesis within our muscles, helping to maintain and strengthen muscles and enabling repair and adaptations in response to exercise. When immobile, however, decreases in muscle mass and strength occur rapidly due to the continuing muscle protein breakdown without the daily stress stimuli to drive muscle protein synthesis. Signaling activity through the mTOR pathway, whose activation normally stimulates muscle protein synthesis, reduces, whilst protein degradation can occur through the ubiquitin proteasome system. After 10 to 14 days of bed rest, rapid muscle mass loss can occur, reducing one's strength and mobility. Once mobile again, the body starts to experience an increase in daily stresses and strains again, which can induce the release of growth and differentiation factors, which trigger satellite cells to divide and fuse to give rise to new myonuclei, the nucleus of a muscle cell. As the mTOR pathway becomes more active, the balance of protein synthesis to breakdown is tipped again to favor synthesis of proteins. The availability of amino acids, the basic building blocks of protein, are crucial for muscle growth and strength. Although some amino acids can be released from other parts of the body, the dietary supply of proteins and therefore amino acids is required to support muscle growth. Once ingested, amino acids diffuse into muscle cells, increasing mTOR pathway activity, stimulating the synthesis of proteins through the ribosome and supporting muscle rebuilding. The DNA in just one of your cells gets damaged tens of thousands of times per day. Multiply that by your body's hundred trillion or so cells, and you've got a quintillion DNA errors every day. And because DNA provides the blueprint for the proteins your cells need to function, damage causes serious problems, such as cancer. The errors come in different forms. Sometimes nucleotides, DNA's building blocks, get damaged. Other times, nucleotides get matched up incorrectly, causing mutations. And nicks in one or both strands can interfere with DNA replication or even cause sections of DNA to get mixed up. Fortunately, your cells have ways of fixing most of these problems, most of the time. These repair pathways all rely on specialized enzymes. Different ones respond to different types of damage. One common error is base mismatches. Each nucleotide contains a base, and during DNA replication, the enzyme DNA polymerase is supposed to bring in the right partner to pair with every base on each template strand, adenine with thymine and guanine with cytosine. But about once every 100,000 additions, it makes a mistake. The enzyme catches most of these right away and cuts off a few nucleotides and replaces them with the correct ones. And just in case it missed a few, a second set of proteins comes behind it to check. If they find a mismatch, they cut out the incorrect nucleotide and replace it. This is called mismatch repair. Together, these two systems reduce the number of base mismatch errors to about one in one billion. But DNA can get damaged after replication, too. Lots of different molecules can cause chemical changes to nucleotides. Some of these come from environmental exposure, like certain compounds in tobacco smoke. But others are molecules that are found in cells naturally, like hydrogen peroxide. Certain chemical changes are so common that they have specific enzymes assigned to reverse the damage. But the cell also has more general repair pathways. If just one base is damaged, it can usually be fixed by a process called base excision repair. One enzyme snips out the damaged base, and other enzymes come in to trim around the site and replace the nucleotides. UV light can cause damage that's a little harder to fix. Sometimes it causes two adjacent nucleotides to stick together, distorting the DNA's double helix shape. Damage like this requires a more complex process called nucleotide excision repair. A team of proteins removes a long strand of 24 or so nucleotides and replaces them with fresh ones. Very high-frequency radiation, like gamma rays and X-rays, cause a different kind of damage. They can actually sever one or both strands of the DNA backbone. 
Double strand breaks are the most dangerous. Even one can cause cell death. The two most common pathways for repairing double strand breaks are called homologous recombination and non-homologous end joining. Homologous recombination uses an undamaged section of similar DNA as a template. Enzymes interlace the damaged and undamaged strands, get them to exchange sequences of nucleotides, and finally fill in the missing gaps to end up with two complete double-stranded segments. Non-homologous end joining, on the other hand, doesn't rely on a template. Instead, a series of proteins trims off a few nucleotides and then fuses the broken ends back together. This process isn't as accurate. It can cause genes to get mixed up or moved around, but it's useful when sister DNA isn't available. Of course, changes to DNA aren't always bad. Beneficial mutations can allow a species to evolve, but most of the time, we want DNA to stay the same. Defects in DNA repair are associated with premature aging and many kinds of cancer. So if you're looking for a fountain of youth, it's already operating in your cells, billions and billions of times a day.